Supposing you had the chance to get rid of some of your worst nightmares, what would they be? My guest is here tonight to persuade me to banish the items on his list into room 101. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Stephen Fry. <laughs> Thank you. Very pleased to see you. Um, good welcome to the show. Um, Stephen, I've met you several times. You've always been very polite, very easygoing, very even tempered. Um, mm. Does it take much to get your dander up? Uh, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty lazy dander, to be honest. Um, <laughs> there are some unpleasant things in the world about which one should get angry, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, mm -hmm. cruelty and poverty and disease and all the things. So how is it that you can spend really what must be 100% of all one's fury on the fact that you've uh, misled your car keys or a sock? <laughs> all right, let's start you off then on your... your this is your first uh, choice for Room 101. Tom Pollin, how do you think it stands up in its revival? <laughs> it was a bit like going back into uh, late 1950s television. Nonsense! It's, it's the most simple-minded biological determinism, which was propaganda for a particularly vicious kind of narrow messianic Americanism. It was a great parody of um, uh, romanticism in it. Uh, I like the monkey. <laughs> that was uh, Tom Paulin on the uh, Late Review, but it's not just him, though. Oh, no, it? no, dear, dear fellow, I'm sure he's a jolly nice chap and all mm. the rest of it. I quite like him, I have to say. Uh, I like him because his name is very similar to Tar Paulin. <laughs> <laughs> Which always amuses me when I see his name come up. He's rather a good poet as it goes, actually. Yes. He's a very good poet. I mean, I'm sure he's a fine man. I quite like his cussedness. Mm. But it's the whole thing of these late night review programmes. And there's mm. a film chap as well who does it. As well. Also, for some bizarre reason, from Northern Ireland. Believe me, I have nothing against Northern Irish at all. Who would dare? And, and I. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, do you know what I mean? I think he's called Mark Cousins, who talks about films in this very delicate way, as if. They're made of crystal and everything is... <laughs> and he kind of uses listen-ness on the end of words all the time. He's got a kind of restlessness-ness and a, a, a hopelessness-ness-lessness. And, uh, and I once heard him talking for 40 seconds about a film without using the word film. It is this vision, <laughs> this quest, this essay into... It's not a vision or an essay or a quest, it's a film, darling. Yes. One of the, one of the classic... Uh, uh, pieces of film criticism. There was a film called If by Lindsay Anderson, about late 60s, I think. Yeah. And there's a, a bit in the film where it goes from Technicolor to black and white. Yeah. And many critics wrote about this extraordinary visionary artist who's dared to take us from Technicolor to monochrome because he's, he's, he's showing us the savagery of the system. And they actually, they'd run out of colour film. <laughs> Absolutely. And they didn't have any money. Absolutely so right. they, they had to use black and white. It's so true. And I, I just, you know, at BBC Two late at night, you, you know, you want something... You want something pleasant. You don't want three people around the table just... <laughs> <laughs> um, and their hands all the time. Uh, it seems to me, every sentence begins with it seems to me. It seems to me that it works on about five levels. Um, <laughs> you always want to say, oh, really, I counted seven. <laughs> no, Twelve. Twelve levels, I think. Or 12, uh, possibly 15 levels. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's just endless. Yeah, I mean, even Jermaine Greer, whom, whom I do admire in many ways, she's just, you know, she's got to the stage now with slightly fierce, almost pince-nez, mm. uh, and almost deliberately slightly dégagé grey hair to make her, you know, slightly more femme savante, blue stocking <laughs> thing. And she's you, terribly you, uh, fierce. You lost me there about five centuries ago. <laughs> <laughs> but if I, if I nod intelligently, <laughs> yeah. I'll look good. You do this, you do this, you swine. You, do, you play the I'm pig ignorant, I've only got a metalwork um, HCMD or whatever it's called. And then you turn around and um, tell me how to pronounce Furtwängler. <laughs> you know, I know you. Well, then this is how newspaper critics get their TV break, isn't it, appearing on these sort of shows? Well, that's right. Most of them are uh, pretty vitriolic and unpleasant uh, uh, TV critics, some of them as well. And there's a woman called Alison Pearson, who um, I'm really, I'm afraid, I, I, she does make me vomit, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> Again, what I, is it about her that makes I, you vomit? I, I, I think it's just... It's just... There's this kind of tiredness about everything, uh, mm. uh, as if she's a sort of headmistress, and if only these people had brought me the script before they made the film, I could have pointed <laughs> out how it could have been a great film. They didn't come and see me. So now they've made it, and I've got to tell them where they went wrong, and all that mistakes, <laughs> you see? Do you read your own crits? I mean, you know... Not anymore, no, no. I, I, I just can't bear it. I mean, I have to admit, I get very upset when, when, when people say nasty things about me, but I don't actually get that delighted if they say something nice about me, mm. because I, mm. I don't really believe that either. Uh, and it, it's not... It's not the act of criticism. I, I think it's, it's more a theological point, really. I just have this feeling that these people are going to go when they're dead, and, and St. Peter's going to say, what did you, you do with your life? 
Well, I looked at things other people did, and I said, that doesn't really work. <laughs> uh, uh, it works on two levels, but no, no, not satisfactorily on either. Uh, and to me, it wasn't as good as the thing you did before. I'm sorry, that's what... I gave you two legs and two arms and, and, and a soul, and you did that for all your life. You told people what was wrong with the stuff they were doing. You know, I think it's just a terrible waste of a life. <laughs> <laughs> but, OK, we've got to, but we must have the art of criticism. I think they, yes, they, but they, they must write it down on a piece of paper. Um, yes. And, um, and they can publish it somewhere if they want in the, in the Times Literary Supplement mm -hmm. or in the film magazine. It's absolutely right and fine. But, but please don't clutter up our valuable terrestrial channel space such as it is. Um, All right. I'm, well, I don't know, Stephen. Am I going to put this into Room 101? Perhaps I should put this in an audience vote. I don't know how, because, I mean, we're, you know, because we're in a, a, a profession where we are judged professionally, it could be accused... It of seems to me it's a very attractive audience. It's an audience that works. <laughs> it works on about 200 levels, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, yeah. OK. On the, basis of, on the basis of that flattery, let's, um, let's see. Um, hands up if you think critics should go into Room 101. Oh. <laughs> well, um, I think you'll all be very pleased to see this happen then. Goodbye to the yeah. critics. Wow. <laughs> OK, so that was, uh, that, was, that was a very, very popular choice of yours. Um, let's I think I've used up the audience. I'll have to phone a friend next time. <laughs> I, I think I... Well, I don't know. This next one you may find be a very popular uh, decision by you. Let's, um, let's dig it out. Oh, this is lovely. Now, look at this. This oh, is... Uh, Christ. Did you describe... <laughs> describe to us what that is. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. It's a collector's plate. <laughs> uh, by presumably... Can I have a look, look at, at it? An back, internationally yeah. renowned artist, it usually tells you. Yeah. Uh, in this case, oh, yes. Slopey writing by Sandra Cuck. This is plate number 159D in a limited edition, and it's called Little One. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Third issue in the Sugar and Spice collection. <laughs> I mean, it is simply loathsome. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think these make me angry on several levels. Yes. Um, <laughs> one of them... One of them is that we live in a truly Philistine age. I mm. mean, um, that symbol for, for everything that is, is, is bourgeois, defensive and aggressive, the Daily Mail, um, <laughs> will spend many, many, many column inches um, decrying modern art and how meaningless it is uh, and how valueless it is. And it's in the magazines of their Mail on Saturday type things that this ghastly... <laughs> I mean, it is just, it's despicable. Well, okay. that, so that's one level. Yeah. The other level is... Uh, as well as being aesthetically worthless, mm -hmm. they are actually physically worthless. I mean, a, a lot of these things promise you that these are collectible items. You, you take it along to an auction room, you, you take this thing here to the Antiques Roadshow. Um, <laughs> after wiping the vomit from their mouth, <laughs> they, would, they would say, f five pence? I don't know. Well, uh, <laughs> that's a complete bloody... Oh, God, what's that? <laughs> well, let me try you on this one. Um, um, I shall read the back of it. This is, uh, this is called Snowy Quest by Terry Isaac. Um, well, I mean, it looks like a tiger. Well, it does. And he's painted that in the wild. You've got to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully aware that one can sound, you know, like a snob about this, mm. because it isn't, you know, mm. um, it isn't Caravaggio or something. Yeah. But Oscar Wilde was once asked when he was a very young man and he was in America, Mr. Wilde, why do you think America is such a violent country? And he said, oh, I know very well why it's so violent. I said, why? He said, because your wallpaper is so hideous. <laughs> um, it, it seemed like a, a, a camp remark from a young Eastie. Yeah. But he's actually quite serious. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you look out of the window um, as a human being um, at nature, mm -hmm. all of nature is unconditionally and absolutely beautiful, wherever it is, whether it's a jungle, whether it's a desert, whether it's the Arctic wastes, uh -huh. or your own backyard. Yeah. The only ugly things you will ever see when you look out of the window are things made by man. And, and if, from your earliest age, looking at, at the world, you see yourself as a member of a species that can only uglify and despoil the world, it gives you what psychiatrists would call a, a deep sense of guilt. And guilt is, as anyone knows, the, is the major cause of aggression. That's mm -hmm. why you get violent, because you're guilty, you feel worthless. Mm -hmm. And you feel worthless if you don't believe you're part of a species that is actually capable of creating beautiful things, mm -hmm. which we are in terms of architecture and in terms of painting and in terms of music and all kinds of things, beauty is possible mm. and is good. This, I'm afraid, is, is the worst thing because it thinks it's beautiful. It doesn't understand where beauty really lies. Well, we've tried to make something beautiful here. Let's see whether this appeals to you. Um...